you use it. Security. <laughs> We're up. I think you. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Dan Rubin. I'm here again with Ad Hoc with a doc. And <clears throat> we've got a very special show lined up. We've got, again, we're here with Dr. Gina Berman. Thank Hello. you again for being on. We're going to talk uh, about cannabis and cancer care. If you remember, uh, on our last episode, Dr. Berman joined us on our show talking about the opioid crisis and the use of opioids uh, for medicine and helping to get people off of opioids, reduce addiction, and also how to uh, utilize cannabis uh, when people are on opioids. Now, Dr. Berman... We're at a dispensary. Yes, yes we're at the Giving Tree. Indeed. Tell us a little bit about about the Giving Tree, and um, let's then segue into the use of cannabis in, in cancer care. Well, the, the original idea for the Giving Tree was um, my business partner and I, uh, Lilac Power, we um, met because her husband is an ER doctor also. So her husband and I were partners in the ER for a long time. And when we met, we were very synergistic and we had a lot of ideas about other things that we wanted to do. And we had talked about putting together a practice that would have complementary therapies, one place where you could get a bunch of different complementary therapies. And um, the problem with that business plan was it was in the like 2008, 2009 period of time. And the economy wasn't doing well and these are out-of-pocket expenses. And so it was mm -hmm. really, it didn't seem like it was something that could work as a business. Okay. So um, we tabled that and we kind of talked about some other things and then um, I heard on NPR one evening leaving work about the um, Prop 203 which is the Medical Marijuana Act and this is in 2010. In Arizona. In Arizona, okay. yes. And so uh, I called her up and I said this is how we're going to make it work. And so we thought we were going to have a um, kind of a stable of patients who had chronic illness and were interested in complementary therapies or interested in alternative type therapies. Mm -hmm. And we can offer, we can subsidize what were going to be expensive uh, therapies with the profits from the cannabis. Excellent. Because um, it's a nonprofit and it's medical. And so we thought that would be the kind of the best of, of all worlds. And it really could make our business plan work. So it gave a lot of life to our business plan. And so that was our business model going into forming the Giving Tree. Um, we currently offer. Uh, yoga classes, Reiki, and massage. We weren't able to offer um, naturopathic services or acupuncture. And, you know, and that's just in dealing with the Department of Health and what they approve on site and what they don't approve. So we weren't ac actually able to fully actualize our plan, but that was the concept, and that's how that's how we created the Giving Tree. And it's wonderful, and there's always a future to that. And um, I know it. I know it. Blue Door. You do have naturopathic medicine and yes. those services yeah, we have as well. All those services. Um, <clears throat> so, in the state of Arizona, uh, medical marijuana is considered medically legal. Yes. And so, there are certain conditions that a physician can write a recommendation for for a patient, and the diagnosis of cancer is one of those conditions. Yes. And so there, I know that there's a stat out there that there was a recent study published that demonstrated that up to 93 percent of people with cancer have a preference in using medical cannabis over opioids. You live in both those worlds. Yes. Have you experienced um, people coming into your dispensary looking for either on their own to convert from opioids or maybe not wanting to use opioids and looking for cannabis? It's interesting that you say that because as the medical director of the Giving Tree, I actually do see patients. I don't write recommendations. By law, I don't write recommendations. <clears throat> But I saw a patient this morning, I see mm -hmm. patients who are not sure if cannabis is right for them or if they have questions or maybe they have a complicated medical history and they want to speak with me about a program. Um, I kept seeing patients and more and more patients I would see who wanted to get off of opioids using cannabis and they were wildly successful in doing it. Now granted this was a very motivated patient population. They sought their cards, they sought me out. They uh, you know, stuck with the plan and they were very motivated to get off of opioids. So that was how I even started the inkling of the idea of Blue Door in that there was a, mm -hmm. a need and a desire in the community for these types of services. So um, I de we definitely see a lot of those patients. That to me is very unique that you're a doctor within the context of that and so the expertise is very well rounded because you can you know the strains that are here at the giving tree yes. 
you know how they work, and um, you also know what strains are appropriate for which kinds of complaints uh, and which types of diagnoses. Is that rare to have a physician staffed at, who's not writing recommendations but who's meeting with patients to talk about what strain they should use versus just what would be considered a bud tender making those types of recommendations? It, it is rare. I only know of one other dispensary who has a physician who is actively consulting and um, uh, treating patients. I don't know if you could call it treating, I guess, but consulting with patients mm -hmm. and um, a lot of education around what the strains are, what are cannabinoids, what are terpenes, how can it help me, and how do you know? Um, so it, it okay. isn't very common, and it's been a, a great honor and a blessing to be able to have the title of medical director where that's my primary focus and my primary job is if a patient writes in and says I have pancreatic cancer I want to use cannabis uh, can it help me well then I do a research and I meet with the patient and I tell them what research I find and what knowledge and so I've spent the last five years doing that and so I've accumulated a fair amount of I don't know everything <laughs> but I've accumulated a fair amount of information well that's a great segue because I think a lot of people out in the audience are, if they're researching, if they have cancer, if they're looking for themselves, or they may have friends and family maybe pushing products at them and saying, oh, this can cure cancer, take this medical marijuana, or go get your card, and maybe take the oil, or take this, or maybe use a vaporizer, or consume it, or eat it. Um, there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace as to whether or not medical cannabis can treat cancer. We're not talking necessarily about in, in this instance about the treatment of people with cancer from a symptom perspective, but actually treat the cancer itself. To my knowledge, there isn't any conclusive evidence that demonstrates that. I know that in England, I believe there's one pharmaceutical company using a medical cannabis mixture of cannabidiol mm -hmm. and THC that's demonstrating um, improvement in survival in people with a certain type of primary brain cancer called glioblastoma multiforme. And they're showing some enhancement of survival. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about what your experience has been in terms of people coming in and saying, I, I need cannabis oil because it's I need to cure my cancer. Mm -hmm. um, we have people like that in our practice who um, are using it to treat their cancer um, to date. I, I know that there's N of 1 cases that are out there, uh, and I think you have a case like an interesting um, story. Tell us about your use, uh, what you see in, in your building or your practice, etc. Well, I, I do see a fair number of patients who are coming in with a diagnosis of cancer and want to know, have me help them put together a program to cure it. And I cannot say that cannabis cures cancer. But what I can say is that there is compelling evidence that it can have a significant effect on the accumulation or the spread of cancer. For instance, it is shown in some studies to decrease um, angiogenesis. And angiogenesis is the formation of new blood supply or new bloodlines. And those new bloodlines can allow the cancer cells to spread. And so that can be a way that cannabinoids or cannabinoids and some other things in the plant, because there are a lot of other things in the plant besides cannabinoids. Um, can help prevent the spread of cancer. There's also a, a fair amount of, of research showing that cannabinoids can make an aberrant cell that's growing, that's not supposed to be growing, or a cancer cell, realize that it's not normal and kill itself apoptosis. And so some combination of cannabinoids or terpenes or whatever is in the plant can help decrease tumor bulk through apoptosis or those cells die off on their own. And it's interesting that in a lot of these studies, the cannabinoids or that combination of, of components that are in the plant seem to leave normal cells alone. And so, for example, in pancreatic cancer, it's been shown to be helpful in addition or conjunction with traditional chemotherapeutics. And it can enhance or have, there can be a synergy between traditional chemotherapeutics and, and cannabis or whatever those components are. And why I stumble over that is because the cannabis sativa plant has a lot of components. There are cannabinoids such as THC, which a lot of people know about, or cannabidiol, CBD, CBN, THCV. There are a lot of cannabinoids. There are, the numbers range depending on what study you're reading, but let's say there's over 80, right? Over eighty constituents in the plant that we about THC and CBD. There's more research on CBN and THCV, but 
that research is accumulating in those other cannabinoids. But then you have terpenes, and terpenes can be things like lemony or beta carophylline, or there are a bunch of different terpenes that really create the effect of the plant. Because if you look at plants are referred to as, let's say, indica or sativa, or sedating or energizing, right? But what makes that plant sedating or energizing? Is it the THC? Well, probably not, because the molecule of THC in, in each of those strains is the same. Okay. And the molecule of CBD is the same. So you have the potency of the cannabinoids, but what else is it that makes one energizing, one more sedating? Um, and so the terpenes play a large role in that. So when you look at studies of cannabis and the cannabis plant and how it can be effective against cancer, there are so many different kinds of plants that it's not a... It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not just a one type of plant. There are so many different strains and so many different combinations of components of the plant. And I don't know that we fully elucidated mm -hmm. what all of those components are. So we're a little bit of working in the dark. But can I tell you about an interesting study? Yes, in, 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 so there's a, uh, Dr. Mary is a, is a brilliant researcher in Israel who I had the honor of meeting. And he, his whole lab is focused on cannabis research. But he got into cannabis research when he was looking at um, the cytoskeleton of cancer cells and how they move. And okay. that is an indication of metastases or movement of cancer cells. And he um, uh, stumbled into some researchers who, who had been looking at cannabis right. or cannabinoids in metastases and how that cytoskeleton changes. Mm -hmm. And so he got into the kind of research of cannabis and cancer, and that was his entryway into doing that. And he told me about a study that he did that was really interesting, and I'm not going to do it the justice that, that he did, um, but I will give you the, the paraphrasing or the close notes on it. But basically, he took several different types of cancer, because the cancers are all so different. Even breast cancer has different kinds of, of um, pathology that cause it to, be, to overrun. So it's it, just like the cannabis plants, cancer isn't a one-stop shop. You can't say you've cured cancer, but there's so many different kinds, right? But anyway, so he took a bunch of different types of cancer and he took different strains. And in Israel, they've had a medical program that's been, um, that, and research that's been around for a long time. So he was able to cross the different strains with the different types of cancer and he got a real patchwork effect. Mm -hmm. So let's say strain one against breast cancer type one, there was 90% apoptosis. That's fantastic. And that means the cells died. That means the cells died, okay. they committed suicide. Mm -hmm. So you have this Petri dish full of thriving cancer cells mm -hmm. that are all abnormal, right, and dysfunctional. And you apply this cannabis strain to it and 90% of those bad cells died. That's amazing. If I had that type of breast cancer, I would absolutely be living on that type of cannabis. But then if you took the same strain and applied it to, let's say, maybe breast cancer of a different type or prostate cancer, maybe there was a 70% reduction or a 20% reduction. It wasn't uniform across the board. And well, the so, same can be said for certain chemotherapies, too. So interesting. This is and, so, and so he found this patchwork with the different types of strains and the different types of cancer. And so, but when a patient comes to me and says, well, what strain should I use? Mm -hmm. I don't know, there's probably a strain that would be very effective and a strain that wouldn't be, and I don't know which one that is because there are so many strains. And what was it about strain one and breast cancer type one that was so effective? So Why was it so effective? Was it the THC? There's THC in all of the strains. Mm -hmm. Was it the cannabidiol? I don't know. Was it some combination? Was, was there a terpene that allowed the THC mm -hmm. to be a vector to get into those cells? That sounds like a very big work in progress to figure out it that is. patchwork. But the point of it is, mm -hmm. it's very compelling. There's something to it. Mm -hmm. We just don't have it dialed in to be, um, to, to have, have enough, enough, of, enough evidence, evidence to be able to point patients in the right direction mm -hmm. and really give them good guidance. It's a little bit of a, of a crapshoot. In terms of, you're, you're talking about direct anti-cancer therapy. Yes. We're not talking about symptomatic relief, right. which is a little bit easier to, to manage. Yes. Um, I'm a naturopathic physician. I was trained in botanical medicine, full plant medicine, and what I hear you really saying is that there is a full plant here, a plant that is on this earth, much like we are on this earth, and it somehow in its wholeness and richness and beauty has a compendium of molecules, over 80 different cannabinoids, terpenes, and some of the other molecules that you mentioned, and some that we don't know, because plants are incredibly complex, mm -hmm. and they interact 
maybe at the genomic level with our normal cells. You mentioned that they leave normal cells alone, which to me starts me thinking about what's called our endocannabinoid system, mm -hmm. um, which there are biochemicals or physiological chemicals in our body that I believe mimic some of the cannabinoid-like effects. Mm -hmm. um, would that be important in terms of the interaction that you're talking about in terms of maybe leaving normal cells to be normal cells and teaching the cancer cells that they too can become normal cells? Well, the, the two uh, best known endocannabinoids are anandamide, which means apparently means bliss in Sanskrit. Okay. Um, Ananda does and then Amid. Um, and then there's another compound called 2-AG. It's a shortened mm -hmm. name for the name. Um, and so these are... Um, Anandamide is a um, is actually produced from the lipid membrane of neuro neuronal cells, and then it goes into the synaptic synaptic cleft, and it can work on cannabinoid receptors. There are two. Is this in our brain? No. Yes. In the brain. And then there there are also peripheral receptors, but and peripheral effects of these. But so there, I mean, there are definitely endogenous cannabinoids, but um, in terms of how they can. Um, how they can be effective against cancer is not clear. We don't know that yet. Yeah. Um, so as a whole plant extract, there's um, there's a lot of work, like you said, talking about some of the ma the main and or let's say the most well known molecules. One which is the THC, which is really the what we would consider all the audience would consider the main psychoactive one that gives the feeling of being high or stoned or what have you. And then the CBD or cannabidiol, which you mentioned too. Mm -hmm. um, and there are stra there are uh, over the counter extracts that are CBD only, mm -hmm. which are uh, you know apparently legal and uh, contain either trace amounts or no THC or acceptable limits. Um, let's move a little bit towards talking about symptomatic relief mm -hmm. because we know in the world of oncology a lot of people have nausea, or they have lack of appetite, they may have anxiety, they may have pain, um, and medical marijuana and these cannabinoids can help treat that. Absolutely. Um, and that's a big, I would think that that's a big reason why people are coming into the your facility here looking for relief of those symptoms and not everybody's just coming and saying, oh, we, you know, please cure my cancer. Correct. There are patients who come in and they specifically want to have improved appetite or want to put on weight or want to help help with nausea. Mm -hmm. um, pain is definitely something that's very well known that cannabis can treat effectively. Um, CBD is an anxiolytic or mm -hmm. anti-anxiety. It's a muscle relaxant. It's a COX-2 inhibitor. So it has an anti-inflammatory or an analgesic effect also. Um, so both of them have properties that can be helpful for patients who are going through chemotherapy or going through cancer treatment um, and need help with those types of symptoms. But I think it was interesting that you, that you commented that 93% of patients prefer cannabis over opioids, and why would that be? I mean, I think that would be a great question because um, opioids are effective at pain, mm -hmm. and opioids can make you feel better too. They mm -hmm. increase, I mean, they act in the, on the same receptor as endorphins, so it's like having mm -hmm. an endorphin rush. Um, it can help with sleep, etc. But the problem with opioids, especially for chronic use, is that there are so many side effects, especially as you go up in potency. So you have um, narcotic bowel, so now you're constipated. Mm -hmm. In addition to not having a great appetite, which mm -hmm. opioids don't help with, mm -hmm. um, now you have narcotic bowel and you have constipation. And endocrinopathy that can happen as you get treated for a long period of time, which I probably talked about before. Um, so you have low sex hormones, uh, cortisol levels are low, thyroid levels can be low. Opioids um, can interfere with normal sleep patterns and cause central sleep apnea, which central sleep apnea will cause you to stop breathing. Interference with normal sleep cycles can just cause you to not get good sleep, and so you don't feel great. So you're not eating, you're constipated, you know, your hormones are not mm -hmm. correct. And so I think for the long term, opioids are not a great um, solution for patients, and a lot of patients agree with that. Yeah. Or some patients don't want to get on opioids in the first place. Well, and they're also one molecule, whereas the cannabinoids is a family of molecules, and it sounds like it's just naturally more appropriately interactive with how a human is built. Yes. So... And I think that's also why it's really interesting to me that um, with, the, with the evolution of concentrates in this country, you have uh, the e-cigarette type pens, you have, like, we make a, a, a bunch of concentrates. And I, I wanted to talk about these products you brought, and yeah. um, some of these you bring into the dispensary, which um, other facilities are produced, and some of these are produced right here in, in your facility. 
Um, and let's show, show our audience a couple of these. So Very I'm going to show you the flower first. And I want to okay. say that the reason I think that over 60% of sales across the country, I get data from Washington, Colorado, mm -hmm. Oregon, and then of course Arizona. But why are why flowers so popular still? Because, I mean, it's, you can, you're putting flame to plant material. Uh, it's, it stinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very smelly. You may mm -hmm. like the odor, but mm -hmm. it's, it's odiferous. You're not going to, it's not discreet by any means. You need paraphernalia to take it unless you're mm -hmm. going to eat the plant, which some people do. Okay. Um, so you can cook with this? You can cook with okay. this, yeah. And you can eat it straight? You can eat it straight, Or yes. you can use a flame to it or some type of heat mm -hmm. source. So if you eat it, then it's not going to be decarboxylated and it's going to be in its acid form, which okay. does have medicinal properties also. Okay. Um, and this is all, this is CBD. This is a strain called ACDC, which is 14 to 16 percent CBD and less okay. than 1 percent THC. Interesting. Um, and But this is as it, so it grows as a plant. Um, when you chop the plant down, it loses about 20% of its weight in water. And so this is kind of the de, it's not dehydrated, but it's definitely had the water sweated off. And okay. then it's cured. Okay. And that means it's put in a sealed airtight container, no, ac no access to light, which okay. will oxidize. Okay. So, um, and so, but patients, I think, really still prefer the plant because this is its natural presence. This is how it comes. It's a plant. There's, not, there's nothing that's been processed in this. Now, so, are you saying that this one may not have the psychoactive effects as some of the TA, more THC-containing products? Mm -hmm. So somebody could utilize this and go about their day? Correct, yes. Interesting. So CBD doesn't engage the reward centers of the brain or cause release of dopamine like THC would. Um, it's anti-inflammatory, anxiolytic, and a muscle relaxant. So it provides a lot in, for, for patients who are getting off of opioids who use CBD very liberally. It helps a lot with cravings. Great. So, um, but um, yes, but it's not psychoactive and you can be functional on it. But it does have some THC in it. And then we make these other concentrates. Like this is a, um, this is like a Listerine breast strip. This is 10 milligrams of THC. I think this is a THC. Yeah, this is a THC per strip. And so it's just as, like you would take a Listerine breast strip. You would Very take discreet. That? It's minty. It doesn't taste like anything. And how long would something like that require to take effect in a person's body before they felt the, the pain effects or the anxiolytic effects or something? This would be a half hour to hour. Okay. All right. um, the flower would be pretty much immediate unless mm -hmm. you're eating it. Um, and cannabinoids and terpenes are soluble in fat and in alcohol. So okay. if you, put, you can put it into a butter or whatever. Um, the concentrates are obtained by putting this through an extraction method. And we use a, a supercritical CO2 extraction method. So there are no residuals, there are no chemicals. Okay. You um, mentioned the act of decarboxylation, which I believe that when you put a heat source or a flame to a flower, then it decarboxylates it. But these concentrates that you have, say, embedded on the breast strip, those are pre-decarboxylated. These have, these have been decarboxylated. Okay. They're active. Through a process that you, at the facility. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Very yeah, good. and so have the, the capsules. So, <clears throat> and these are capsules that we make, and so you can dose these. These are, I believe these are, these are 50 milligram CBD capsules. Fif five zero milligrams? Five zero. And mm -hmm. there's, is there an oil in there? Yes. So it's coconut oil and then cannabis oil together. Okay. And there's no TH, is there THC in there? There is a small amount of THC in okay. here because it comes from this plant creates this Very good. concentrate. So somebody who might not want to use the flour, they could then just swallow a capsule. Absolutely. And, and what would be the onset compared to almost immediate here? What would be the onset of 50 milligrams of CBD? Um, anything that's going to be metabolized by the liver is going mm. to take longer. Okay. And so it can be up to two hours to achieve okay. effects. Some people are an hour, some people are half an hour. It really depends on your cytochrome P450 system in your liver, which Indeed. we cannot test with. So somebody so. who may be not able to utilize flour during the day but may need the anti-inflammatory effect of CBD could maybe use flour in the morning before they leave and then for their day, and then maybe take some capsules with them. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. they can be medicated Or a breast strip, or we have a spray, or, or there are a lot of different alternatives. Excellent. Absolutely. And then, um, uh, what was I saying about the capsules? So it can take up to two hours to have effect. Okay. Um, but the, the nice thing about the anything that's metabolized by the liver is that also lasts a lot longer. Okay. And for patients who are taking a THC-based um, edible or a capsule or something that's going to go through the digestive system, there's a higher metabolic uh, metabolism to 11 hydroxy THC okay. that you don't see in the pulmonary capillaries, for example, mm. um, and that is a more potent metabolite. The, the, the 11 hydroxy THC, 11 hydroxy. as opposed to the delta 9 THC, which Got is it. what's naturally in the plant. Got it. So edibles can be a little more potent. That's what I mean to say by that. 
Wonderful. What so. do you have a spray there? This is actually a Kaya oil. We do have a spray. I don't okay. have it here with us, but we do have a spray. Um, and sprays are nice. It's a submucosal absorption, okay. so it's about half hour to an hour, just like the breast strips. Um, and uh, so very discreet. And per pump, our spray is 6.6 .6 milligrams. And this is a high potency oil. Now this is different, yeah. So okay. this is called Kaya oil. We do not make this. It's made by a, a High Mountain Health and Flagstaff. They're a great company. And um, it is a constant, it's like Rick Simpson oil, but okay. it's not Rick Simpson oil. And Rick Simpson oil has been very popularized, sort of one of the original recipe types. I have a lot of patients coming in asking mm -hmm. about the use of Rick Simpson oil. And this is not Rick Simpson oil, but it is a medical marijuana oil extract. It is. In concept, it's very similar. Okay. Because what Rick Simpson oils, uh, what he accomplishes with his extraction mm -hmm. method is a very, very potent plant-based oil. Okay. Um, the the issue that I have with Rick Simpson oil and why we don't carry it mm -hmm. and why I caution patients is that some of the chemicals that he recommends using for the extraction can be flammable or can be dangerous or you need to make sure there are no residuals because they can okay. be you don't want to be ingesting those chemicals. If you're very confident about your handling of those chemicals and you're confident about not having residuals, there's a recipe on his website. You mean for patients to perhaps buy flour and, make it and then make it at home. Um, so I like Kaya oil because it's not made with uh, dangerous chemicals. This is a THC one to two, so okay. two parts CBD to one part THC, so okay. you get both. Okay. Um, and you also, it's you can see it's very concentrated. So you twist this and it comes out of the... Of the so it's a regulator, range. so you can really regulate your dose. You're probably not going to overdose right. um, if you, if you follow instructions. It's a grain of half of a grain of rice wow. of this maybe to start with. It's very potent. And so it accomplishes a lot of the same. It's plant-based, mm -hmm. um, very, very concentrated cannabis oil. And so patients will use this. Um, there's a regimen, again, that Rick Simpson has on his website. Mm -hmm. and I believe Kaya has something on, on their website about what the regimen should be to take the to take the product again and in a product, I wouldn't say it's going to cure cancer but indeed. I don't think well, we can't say that yet we can't I think say there's it, there's interesting case reports out there mm -hmm. like you said about the patchwork uh, Dr. Mary I think you said mm -hmm. was doing in Israel it's it's a process but this is a plant and right. it's a it's a plant that's here on the earth and that we are able to utilize medically mm -hmm. I mean even opioids have an origin in plant-based medicine they do the opium and, poppy the opium mm -hmm. So, well, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate pr appreciate you letting us come into your facility and educating us about the use of medical marijuana, the choices that patients have out there, um, how to use it safely, the benefits, where the research is. I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing for you. the people of Arizona. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. Hi everybody, in case we haven't gone off the air yet. <laughs> Are we good, Michael? <laughs>